welcome to Vine Chat with Chow St. Louis and Wine Tap Tips from Wild Wine Life. I'm here with my good friend Niccolo Biscardo from Biscardo Imports or Exports. I guess both. Both. <laughs> both. Hello. Uh, and we thought we'd kind of talk a little bit about Italian wines, barbecue, and other fun things. Absolutely. Uh, one of the, and for a quick disclaimer, a lot of people hear me talk about cheat on your wine, not your spouse, and this is my way of avoiding royalty fees to Niccolo. Niccolo <laughs> is the one who taught that to me, and thus to you. Absolutely. Um, Niccolo, can it's one of my favorite lines. It, it is a great line, and it's, <laughs> and it's a bit of truth. It really absolutely, is. absolutely. You have to have your priorities straight. You know, If you have to be faithful, you want to be faithful to your wife, not to a variety, not to a wine. You gotta fool around with wine. Be faithful with your wife. Right. One commitment in life is more than enough. <laughs> no more than one. One, and that's it. So we have two thousand varietal just in Italy. Have fun with all of them. Why not? Yeah. Don't be married to one just because you like it. Keep experiencing. Keep enjoying. Have fool around. Fool around. Fool live. Around. Live life. Live a zest for life. Absolutely yes, absolutely yes. Get your priorities straight. <laughs> Can we sample a few of your wines? I would love to, I would love to. Uh, let me introduce super quickly, you know, uh, just to give an idea who we are and what we do. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, well, as you said, my name is Nicola Biscardo. My family has been making wine in Valpolicella, which is a little valley north of Italy in Veneto region, where Verona is, the city of Roma and Julia. Mm -hmm for four generations now. So it was the late 1800s where my great-grandfather started making wine over there. Which wine do we make? Valpolicella wines. So in Valpolicella we grow primarily three varietal, as most of our uh, viewers know already, Corvina, Rondinella and Molinara. And with those three grapes you make Valpolicella wines that have different styles. It can be regular Valpolicella, it can be the big Amarone wine, or it can be the Valpolicella Ripasso, which is something in between. Having said that, my dad had the uh, great idea back in 1987. I remember there were no internet, no cell phone, no emails, just fax machine start, starting, you know, working, right? So he started this company to be able to bring his own wine in the United States by himself without an importer. So we are American, excuse me, we are Italian wineries, but we are also American importers, so to speak. So he gathered six friends, us from Veneto, a guy from Alto Adige, a guy from Pimo, a guy from Toscany, a guy from Friuli, and one from Market. We built this little company to be independent importer in the United States, cutting the middleman out and getting, you know, high quality at a reasonable price point. Because each one of our wineries in the group is an independent growers. We don't deal with commercial wineries, which means that we don't buy grape and we don't buy wine. Everything is a state grown, produced, and farmed. There's a family behind each one of these labels? Independent family behind each one of these labels. Those are wines with a soul, with a connection to the soil with multiple generations. So we're a simple farmer that decide to you know, crash their grape and make their wine. I've been doing this for several generations. Like me, I'm four, I have wine it up to the seventh generation, wine it up to the second generation, but all wine with, a, with an history and with a connection to the soil. That's why we have, for example, today, we have uh, uh, six wines, but three wineries, one, two, and three. Those five wines are from Piedmont, but they're from two different wineries. Because this guy here is the Rivetto family, which is in Serra Lunga, which it's a big Barolo producing area. Okay. But also Barbera are very important in Piemonte region. So we have Tenuto La Meridiana in the Monferrato area that they only make Barbera. So each one of these, which one of my producers is literally married with few, very, one or three top four varietals because they're very specialized on their own appellation, so they make single vineyard wine. But in France, they call the cru, like the single vineyard. Like the, the grape come only from that very little spot on that hill, so it's a very distinct identity. 
you, you get more terroir or sense of place and identity in your wines as opposed to something that sources of, and I'm not saying that cooperative fruit is bad, Absolutely. it's just it's just different because the fruit source is over such a wide area, it's almost like a blended scotch that it has just a house style, but you don't get that sense of place where with your wines you get that soil, that sense of place, and you truly do get vintage variants. Absolutely. Those are very terroir driven and vintage driven. We want that the vintage shines through the glass. Um, I always say there are only two ways of making the wine around the world. You can be in Italy, in France, in Spain, in, in Napa, in Oregon, in Chile. There are only two ways of making the wines. Okay. Commercial mm -hmm. or boutique. Those are the two big um, discrimination between the two wines. All the big commercial industries, they follow the same criteria, the same dynamic, and the same, I can say, uh, um, even the wine, you know, the same layout, the same cooking uh, in infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because from the vineyard to production, it's about quantity. Mm -hmm. And of course, don't get me wrong, quality, healthy product, but if you need to make a million bottles of wine, you, all those million bottles of wine, they need to taste the same. From bottle one to bottle one million, they gotta taste the same. They cannot have this. While boutique producers, small producers, it's not that they're smarter, it's just a different philosophy. They only make the wine with their fruit. So what the big guy is trying to avoid, which is those differences, the small producer are trying to bring it up as much as possible. I want that within the border of my estate, this vineyard and this vineyard and this vineyard, which means this terra, this terra, and this terra, really shine. How do I do that? Lowering, 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 lowering the production. The more you select the grape within mm -hmm. your vineyard, the more different kind of wine you can make just with one grape. You take these guys, for example. Yes. Giampiero. He makes five wines with one grape only in the same estate. And if we line up the five wines now, they're day and night one from the other. It's all about where you pick your grape. So, are they block different? Are they, are they different vineyards or different vineyard blocks? Are, are, are three different vineyards? Yes. And within those three different vineyards, he has different block where he actually pick the grape. And the wine change dramatically. Now, you understand that you need to have the time to do this mm -hmm. and the infrastructure for this, which means that very small tank where you can actually ferment separately the highly selected grape that come from your vineyard. There is no point to select in the vineyard if everything goes in the same huge gigantic tank. So as I said, those are the two differences and all the small producer will work to lower their yield per hectare per acre, sorry, I speak Italian, it's okay. uh, their ear per acre, they will um, do all the tricks that nature provides to stress the vine to the proper limit of survival. So stress vine makes good wine, but without over stressing, because if you kill the vine, you don't get anything, right? Right. So to put them in a healthy competition, I would say, and then when you select, the, the, your infrastructure is a smaller winery with very small tank, so you can separate the fermentation and get the different soul of your terroir, and then smaller barrel where you can, again, age differently the different potential that you find in your vineyard. Oh. It's very simple. It's not rocket science. No. Like wine making, it's the same all over. Of course, it changes the beauty, it changes the landscape, it changes the varietal, but the rules, you take it, you squeeze it, you ferment it, you age it, you sell it. I mean, it's not, it's not that in Italy we have the vine with the root up in the air and the fruit in the soil, or we grow them horizontal. I mean, it's, you, you grow the grape in the same way and you make the wine in the same way. But you also and, buy it, drink it, and enjoy it. I, I tell, so, oh, yeah. I, the, that's you know, the key, the, you know, that's the purpose. The, 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 the funny thing is how many people, and, and there's nothing wrong with collectors, you know, God bless them, you know, they buy a lot of wine, they spend a lot, they, of, money. They spend a lot of money, 
But the most important thing is, you know, wine is an art, but you don't appreciate the art staring at the bottle. You appreciate the art drinking it. It's meant to be consumed and enjoyed. You I'm can't sorry. appreciate the, you know, art at the art gallery can't be enjoyed unless you visually see it. Wine is an art you can't appreciate it unless you pop it open and drink it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for saying that. I will never be grateful enough. That's exactly <laughs> the point. You don't collect wines. You collect the memories that you have when you drink it. And that's, I always say, wine is not a collectible item for the same reason you just said. You can collect art because the, uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong with English, no, no. The, the, the purpose of the portrait or, or the sculpture is to stimulate an emotion looking at it. Right. So yes, you can collect art and every time you look at it, they're like, oh my God, you can collect watches. Mm -hmm. And then you can wear, you have like a thousand watches, you cannot wear all of them, but every day you can change one. You can collect cars and take one a ride once in a So the purpose of that object actually comes handy. But as you said, wine, the purpose of wine is to stimulate the taste buds and the nose to bring those flavors and those emotions. Therefore, it's not co you're collecting bottles. You collect the wine only when you actually Drink it. drink it. I mean, I have said, I mean, for example, I mean, you, you have a wine, I, can, I save the empty bottles. What was the first wine I consumed I agree. at the new house? What was the wine that, you know, I, I gave a relative of mine a bottle of wine for his 80th birthday, mm -hmm. but it was a 23-year-old bottle of vintage champagne from the year that his first grandson was born. So it's something he could drink. Not only beautiful. his son, how, how is beautiful? Right. I mean, so it's not on. right. You don't collect and just look at it. You wait until you're there with your son and your grandson, and three generations can drink it Absolutely. and enjoy it. And, that, and that's where the art comes from, because then it's a bonding memory, and that's the truth. You know, and, you, and you enjoy the vertical, uh, you know, the taste and how it's evolved over the years, just like we have changed over the years to say, where was I at? It, when this how one did I look? Through, how did I look? How I had gray I hair, and I was young, and I'm like, you know, absolutely, definitely. I always say, wine is not a collectible item. They fool themselves when they, those collectors. I always tell them, you are a warehouse manager. Your storage, your storaging, storage, no, yes, yeah. you're storing, 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 excuse me. Well, you're storing the wine. You're not collecting the wine. You collect it the moment you drink it, and you collect your memory. Because it's not collectible. Yeah. It, I mean, I look at a, a bottle of wine. I remember certain bottles that I mean, the whether it's a, oh, my God, food wine pairing moment, and then you remember what that wine was and what that food was. Absolutely. Um, can we try your rosé? I mean, time to drink, right? Time I'm not to talking. That, that, well, I'll tell you, rosé, I tell people, is one of the most versatile things. It goes with everything. Um and unfortunately for me, it's the one wine that gets me into trouble. <laughs> um, because it's so easy to drink. Absolutely. Definitely. And uh, so now we're, we're doing a little tour, right? Mm -hmm. We're taking the bus. Okay. And we oh, we are two of us. Get in the car, so it's more comfortable. More comfortable. And we go all the way up to Piedmont region, Piemonte. Piemonte is the far northwest corner of the Alps. There are separating Italy from France, like neighboring France. Yes. So Piemonte is the land of very big red wine, but made primarily, primarily, the two leading grapes in Piemonte are Nebbiolo, which are the grape of Barolo and Barbaresco, the big full body red wine, and Barbera. So this one is Tenuta la Meridiana, Barbera, Piemonte, Rosé. We are the only, or at least the only Barbera Piemonte that I rosé that I found in the United States. We are the first one to bring it in. Wow. We like to experiment. So, as I said, Giampiero, I enjoy to call him the philosopher of the Barbera because he makes five wine with one grape, and finally he makes this rosé, Piemonte Rosato in Italian. What about this rosé? Well, you can see from the color, it's a very pale rosé. Uh, 
I use the expression is a very Provence style rosé. Let me open a little parenthesis here. Rosé finally are extremely popular in the United States. It took a little while. Why? Because due to the what it was called white Zinfandel, the rosé sweet wine, the American consumer got the opinion that rosé wine were sweet. But in the old world, in Europe, it's absolutely not the case. Rosé wine are actually dry, beautiful, enjoyable wine. So the first that actually uh, stayed was really able to break through and, in, and I don't want to say impose, but promote and, and, and make the rosé famous popular in the United States was actually Provence in France. Mm -hmm. So the American audience thought that all the rosé should be extremely light, pale color like this. Italian rosé, usually, especially the more you go south, they get deeper rosé color. Rosé comes from roses, so they look like roses. While the uh, Provence style is more what we call onion peel. Or salmon color. Or salmon color, like those orangey, tends to orange more than roses. So sometimes I argue, I say, you should call it orange instead of rosé, <laughs> because there is not many roses here, it's more like orange peel, but that's another point. So the style of Piemonte, it's this beautiful floral nose, mm -hmm. but then the Barbera immediately kicks in with the minerality, almost saltiness, sea salt on the palate, and a very settled but present of acidity, which makes the wine very refreshing. So th this has a nice salinity, so I'm thinking mm -hmm. like a big bowl of anchovies, but it also has weight, and it's something that will cool you off if you're standing outside grilling or barbecue. Absolutely. And, I mean, this is a true barbecue wine, and that kind of leads me into, I want to, I want you to tell everybody that story that you, when I went to Europe, everybody goes, oh, I barbecue, and ends up being, they're actually grilling. Absolutely. But Nicolo actually does barbecue. He's a European oh, yeah. person that actually barbecues. And could you tell everybody the story of how you learned about American, American barbecue? barbecue? Yes. Well, it's a funny story because I actually claim to be the guy that imported barbecue in, 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 your, in, in Italy. You know, I was in Europe, but in Italy. Well, this is because, you know, when you study English, you know, they, they teach you all the different vocabularies. Yeah. And from the school time, they always translate at home, at school, barbecue with grilling. Like, yeah. if you're barbecuing, you're out in your yard with your grill, charcoal, and you're cooking meat. Right. So, we always assume that barbecue means grilling. <laughs> and in Italy, grilling is a big thing. Right? Yeah. We, for centuries, they were grilling meat. Then, coming in the United States, I learned that barbecue means low and slow, which is a completely ball game. Indirect and heel, Heat, excuse me, indirect and heat, you know, with the charcoal on the side, the meat on the other side, and then preparing the meat before with the rubbing, dry rub, wet rub, and then the barbecue sauce. I mean, it's a, it's a world, it's a planet of information. So, my dad, which was the guy that had the idea to put the group together, my father always had very good ideas. He said, I bet that the Italian would love the real barbecue. And Valpolicello, where I'm from, it's really on the other side of the hill where the Lake Garda is. Lake Garda is the biggest lake of Italy. We get a lot of tourists on the lake. And on the other side of the Alps, there is Austria, Germany, Switzerland. So they all come down to the lake because it's, Italy is so close by and it's the warmest, warmer place for them to come in summertime. Okay. So we have a lot of what it was then international tourism. Don't forget, Europe was born yesterday. So for me, a French guy was a foreigner, a German guy was a foreigner. Now we are European, but they were all foreigners coming, that we don't even speak the same language. So we have an international crowd coming that will love barbecue. So I thought, that's a great idea. So he said, do you want to go and, uh, and learn how to, you know, how to barbecue? I'm like, sure. So I thought I was going you know, to, to New York, yeah, and uh, and you know, and I have, I was twenty, I was twenty four, so young kid, fresh out of you know college, <laughs> and I'm, 
So you're going to go for a, for a, for six months or a year, depends on you like it, and you're going to work there so you can get your English better and you learn something. I'm like, yes, I was thinking New York, LA, Miami. So I get to Milan because there were no flight out of Verona, and I see the ticket and I go, Albuquerque? <laughs> I said, what is this? <laughs> it's in, in New Mexico. That's where you're going. I'm like, I'm not going. Like, oh yeah, you're going. So if you think you're going to New York to party with your Italian buddies until five o'clock in the morning with my money, you got it wrong. <laughs> you go to Albuquerque, you'll be the only Italian guy in the state of New Mexico. <laughs> you either learn English or you die. I'm like, <laughs> so I got there and I start working in a beautiful little restaurant called Rob Ribs. And I still remember, on San Pedro and Candelaria. And they were only doing barbecuing. So I started as a busboy because my English was horrible. And then I worked my way up. From, from busboy, I, I got accepted into the, the kitchen. You know, and then I start you know, uh, preparing the ribs. So peeling the membrane inside, yeah. preparing the rub, rubbing the brisket, rubbing the, bri the, the, the ribs, the baby back, the spare ribs. You know, I got all those things. And at the beginning, it was really, really confusing because, you know, then they start, they put me to wait tables. So, you know, then you also have to wait tables. I'm like, okay. So, I was, you know, if you were working in an Italian restaurant, it would be easy because, you know, even if they mispronounce something, they say, they say, linguini instead of linguine. I'm not dumb. I understand what you want. But it was like, you know, green chili corn pudding, chicken enchilada, brisket, <laughs> double baked potatoes. I'm like, I couldn't even understand what we were talking about. And then I was trying to take the orders and, and they were like, hmm, how do you make your ribs? I'm like, are you asking me? I'm from Verona, for God's sake. What do I know? How do I? So I still have it today, the menu at home with, all my, with a pencil, all the notes, you know, how to make this, how to make that. It was an amazing learning experience. And I got my passion for really the low and slow. And so I start importing the style. I got, I managed to have a Weber. Mm -hmm. I was the only Weber in Italy. Now you can find Webers, but there were no Webers to start smoking and, and smokers. And then I remember when I was, I was, I always a fun tech talk, talking about it. I would say I was like a drug dealer because I was smuggling uh, bags of wood chips, you know, hickory, maple, <laughs> you know, because in Italy we didn't have chips to smoke the meat, excuse me, oak chips. You can have wood, but not all those flavor oak right. chips. So I was loading my, my luggage with oak chips and then, you know, getting home and be like kind of the boss, you know, like the, like the soprano guy, like, Okay, how many bags do you need? You know? <laughs> so I want three bags. I don't know if I give you three. I might give you one and a half. You know? <laughs> now, now they're all stuff that you can actually buy also in Italy. But uh, it was fun to see my friends get hooked into it. And now I create monsters because now they all want to compete with me. And because they all want to defeat me, they want to prove that they are better. So now they're getting all those, you know, on Amazon, you can yeah. buy all those um, thermometers with like five, six different temperatures. You put in all different meat and stuff and say, look what I buy today. Look. And now we do a contest of, uh, of barbecuing also in Verona. So. Do you, so, so you actually have barbecue competitions now? Oh yeah. Well, not official as you have it here, but among, you know, in my village, we yeah. the different friends. Now I have uh, 12 of them that are really hooked into barbecuing, like, like really seriously into barbecuing. Actually, they barbecue more than me because I'm traveling so much, but they're really, really serious. They don't fool around. I'm trying to get some friends to join a barbecue team with me, and I want to call it the Bacchus, Bochi, and Barolo. So the 3B, the I, love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. They have a big, a, big, a big photo of the god Bacchus, with a slab of ribs in front of them, a glass of wine in one hand, and a bocce ball in the other. In the other? That's awesome. I like it. I really do. I really do. That's a great idea. And actually, there are a lot of good wines that do very well with barbecuing. I thought they didn't, but instead, there are a lot of wine that you can really enjoy, and this rosé is one of them. You know why? Because this is not just what you pair with the barbecue. It's what you drink while you're, you're barbecuing. barbecuing. And that's the key. You need to have something because barbecue means from the minimum of four 
up to 16 hours, 18 hours cooking. So you cannot start with a big wine. You need to barbecue with something refreshing, light, and enjoyable. It cools you down. It cools you it down. It cools you down. People something talk. easy. And, and here's the wonderful thing about rosé. You know, you drink, you know, a lot of people drink beer when they're outside cooking. I'm like, why? It bloats you. It bloats. It bloats you. Absolutely. I mean, dry rosé. Too much calories up front. Yeah. And, and, you know, you have all that carbon dioxide and, you know, you, you're all... It's bloated. liquid carbs. Yeah. You know, you it's know, like that. drinking pasta. Yeah. Which I love it. Don't get me wrong. But, as you said, yeah, what? You know, the, the, the rosé cools you down, it's refreshing, you can have it by itself, it'll work with all the sides at barbecue, as well as Absolutely. any of the meats that you're going to do. Definitely. It's a super versatile wine, and I cannot stress this enough, it's just have fun with rosé. Rosé is a great way to socialize and enjoy and have fun with any. You never go wrong. You can really pair it with almost everything. Now, are you amazed at how many Italians here in America are, have, are barbecue fanatics? It's really interesting, yes. Because it's something that you cannot find in Italy, so it hooks you in. It's like a draw. You get hooked into it. And it's also technical, so it's also challenging. It's something that every time you see what is the result. And that's why I like it so much, because you think you get the technique down to perfection, but then every time there is a little detail, a little detail, and then the, your body tells you something, another little trick, another thing, and those flavors are really in layers, it's like a wine barbecue, yeah. are all layers and layers and layers of flavor. So it's really, really interesting the way it works, and I and I really enjoy it. Yeah. Every time it's love. Apply, you know, deal with the outside temperature if it's extremely hot or extremely cold. Absolutely. The wood or charcoal. The charcoal, the, which, the, which, the which varies. Which yeah. varies. And, I mean, the, the variables that go into it. And so, and then cut to cut. I mean, and the meat. And absolutely. The meat. Um, my, you know, Mike Emerson over at Pappy's told me that the most difficult cut, in his opinion, was brisket. And I've had other people tell me that, you know, because it varies from... You know that it's very uh, the size of the brisket varies so much. And it's very so much, and every animal is different. So it's not that is one rule for everything. And and then it's a lot like wine that every vintage is different. You know, one vintage. I mean, you can do a cookie cutter style of wine that it's always going to be new oak. It's always going to be twelve months, Absolutely. and then we're going to release it. But but you're going to release that thing. Yeah, but a boutique winery is going to say, okay, well, this is a softer vintage seven months old, but this is a bigger vintage, we need 15 months old. Absolutely. Um, as so, well as you adjust your temperature or your length of cooking in barbecuing. It's not always, you know, an hour or a pound or whatever. It's, you got to see. Think about the challenge also that in Italy, we don't have the same cut of meat that you have here, or at least we don't have all of them, or they have different names. So every time I was going back home and I said, uh, I want to buy a brisket. And I said, and my butcher was like, what the hell is brisket? And I'm like, I have no idea. I mean, when I'm in the United States, I go to the butcher and say, give me brisket, and they give me this piece of meat. But I'm not a butcher, so I don't know from which part of the animal actually exactly come. A lot of people, the barbecues, they don't know, they're not professional cow uh, raiser, how do you call it? Uh, ranchers. Ranchers, and so you just, buy this or buy that. And so I couldn't find the rebuy. I couldn't find the uh, New York Street. I couldn't find the... The brisket was my biggest challenge because they don't make that cut because they use the meat in a different way because we have different recipes in it. Mm -hmm. So I finally realized that brisket is punta di petto, which is the breast of the, uh, of the, of the cow. Yeah. So I was able to convince my butcher, he says, I need la punta di petto. He came out with the punta di petto, which is like this big. I'm like, what am I going to do with that? So uh, to tell him, you know, it needs to be cut in this way, then they look at you weird because he says, well, what do I do with all the other waste? Because it doesn't fit into the Italian cut that people will actually buy. So it was a challenge. Also, also the rack, racks of, of, of uh, ribs. ribs. They don't, usually in Italy, they don't come in racks. They really come separate because that's how individual individual, individual. 
So that's how we grill them. Because when you grill, because we don't barbecue ribs in Italy, we grill them. So you grill them to cook them on a grill. High temperature is independent, one of one single bone, and you keep you know turning them until they're cooked. So to have them in a slab, slack, slab, a slab, a slab. to have them in a slab was really a big challenge. Now they give you the slab, but it's not trimmed like St. Louis style or Memphis style. So to convince them to trim that that, that, that way, they say, and what we're gonna do with the rest? You gotta buy everything. And I, I don't need all that flappy thing that goes, it's like, but what we're gonna, we cannot sell it. <laughs> so it was really challenging. Now, that was 1994, my friend. So now barbecue, it's becoming a thing in Italy too. So there are more and more butchers that are willing to, uh, um, I can say, in, um, exploring in those American cuts. And, and they're becoming very successful because all the people who want to barbecue, that's where they go to barbecue. That's where they go. Like uh, even the, um, how do you call it, flank steak. Yeah. I couldn't find a flank steak to save my life. Uh, and it's diaphragma. Now it says it's diaf- I know it's diaphragma, which is you know what separates the loins from, yeah. from the from the bottom. So I said, oh, it's diaphragma, good. So I went to the you know to, to the grocery store. Said, you have diaphragma? Look at me as I'm coming from Mars. I had to convince <laughs> the guy. Said, you want diaphragma for what? Well, I'm grilling him like whatever. You know those are those uh, not prestigious cut of meat, but actually they're super tasty. So I, I had this barbecue uh, party uh, at home and uh, I told my friends, I'm going to make uh, skirt steak and, uh, and flank steaks. So I went to, my, to a butcher, I convinced him to get diaphragma. And then uh, he gave me, I said, I need some, I, said, I need to order it because usually they don't really. So <laughs> I went and said, is the diaphragma right? Oh yeah, yeah. It came up with 37 kilos, which is try to say About seven, 80, eight pounds. 80 pounds of meat. I'm like, what am I going to do with 80 pounds of meat? Like, I guess it's going to be good for the entire summer. I'm like, I guess so. And we were just, fl- and my friend now are hooked into Flamestead. Now, if you want to have some fun, go to the butcher and tell me what pork steaks. Pork steaks? Pork steaks. That's the St. Louis thing. Uh, basically, you, you won't find pork steaks. You won't find, no, actually, uh, it, all it is is in other parts of the country they're now promoting it, but they're called pork shoulder cut steak. So basically, it's just a pork shoulder that they've cut into steaks, and you can grill this. One. Sounds fun. <laughs> and now the problem: you cannot find pork shoulders. You cannot find pork shoulders anywhere. Now you know in Italy how big prosciutto is. Yeah both ham and raw prosciutto, parma prosciutto, but if you want to go to a grocery store mm-hmm. and buy pork shoulder to barbecue, you never find it. Because nobody buys the entire shoulder, take it home to grill, to barbecue it. So a friend of mine is, a, a, my, 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 actually my cousin is a, I'm lucky because I have one of my dearest friends and my cousin are both uh, prosciutto and salami producers. Oh. So they have their own pigs. So I go there and say, please put a shoulder on the side because I want to barbecue it. But I couldn't find it a pork shoulder. Wow. It's it's challenging. You were talking about the pre- but if you're getting if your pigs are being sourced from prosciutto um hogs, I I bet you must be having some very, very tasty uh if you can put your hands on it, yes, definitely. The problem is that they are very, they don't give you shoulders or, uh, or thigh because they're all used for prosciutto production. Huh. So you can have like uh, uh, what we call bracciole, which can be like uh, a uh, pork chop, mm-hmm. pork chops. Or you can have sausages, as many sausages as you want because every region, actually almost every town has its own recipe for sausage. So we have a gazillion different sausages. And you can have costine, which is the ribs, but again, independent bones, not in a slab. Now you can also find a slab, but most of the time, if you don't know, if you don't ask for the slab, you already find the pre cat Oh. Yep, that's the way, unfortunately. 
but I got a new uh, supplier um, that is um, close by Verona, um, and um, he raised uh, black angus. So he's specialized on black angus, and he farms. He, he raised the cattle, 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 cattle himself, and then he does the American cuts. So even the tomahawk, the big tomahawk steak with 100% black angus, uh, ribeye, nurse streak, uh, t bones, you know, all those you know specific uh, cut that you find over here, uh, sirloin, you know, all those things that. In Italy, you know, whatever. I, I, I want to see the expression of the first Italian that asked for a tomahawk steak, gets it, and goes, I asked for a steak for myself, not for my family. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say that big steak are very popular in Tuscany. The famous Fiorentina cut is actually your porterhouse. The minimum size is uh, 1.2 kilos, which is... Uh, 2.5 pounds for one steak. So that's the minimum size. So and then you go up from there. You can go up to four or five pounds for a steak. And those come with Chianina uh, cow, which is the white cow of Valdichiana in Tuscany. So big steaks are popular, but all the other cuts are different, or they call them differently. So they're difficult, most difficult at the beginning for me to find them. Now, next time you come to Italy, uh, we go in Tuscany. To the uh, they call it the, the poet of the butcher, and is in little village in in Panzano. It's a little village in uh, in uh, in Tuscany, and the guy it's just the it's the Michelangelo of the butchers. Oh God, I gotta go there. Uh, but we talk about it another time. Because that is worth another episode by itself. Okay, the guy is incredible. So uh, let's move on. Yeah, let's move on. So we go from 100% Barbera made by Tenuta La Meridiana and is rosé because it's only four hours skin content. What do I mean skin content? The time that you allow the skin of the grape to stay together with the juice. Okay. When it comes to white wine, you soft press and you separate immediately the skin and the juice ferment by itself. When it comes to red wine, the red wine ferments entirely on the skin and gets all the color. When it comes to rosé, it varies between four, six, seven hours. It depends how deep you want your color. The key is to keep the temperature very low, so the fermentation is very slow. The juice gets the flavor without getting too much color. So here you have four hours of skin content. The same grape, the same grape coming from the same vineyard, they go into cement. Mm -hmm. uh, Gian Piero still use concrete baths and they ferment for 15 to 20 days on the skin for the Barbera Quattro Terre. So in this case is cement fermentation, which is, a, which is still today a very ancient way, a very traditional way of fermenting grape. Now, in the 70s, everybody knocked down the cement and they moved on onto the stainless steel because it's cleaner, it's easier to sterilize, and is more healthy. And easier to temperature control, a lot of it was a huge innovation stainless steel. Well, 20 years later, they realized that on certain varietal, the concrete, the cement, was actually affecting in a marvelous way the wine. And Barbera is one of them. So, the Barbera, they're fermented in cement, they are extremely soft and extremely smooth. And a number of chemical reactions that happen in those cement buds, and so the Barbera comes out so elegant and so silky and so soft. John Piero, I call him the philosopher of the Barbera because he makes five Barberas with one grape. What is the Quattro Terre? Quattro Terre means the four soil, the four terra. Because this one is not a single vineyard, but is a second, we talk about it selecting, 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 mm -hmm. is a second selection during harvest from the three different vineyards that have four different terroir, they go all together into the entry level friendly wine. Okay. So 
Quattro terre, four soil, you can see the color, sand, iron, limestone, and clay. So Giampiero says, this is not a single vineyard, it comes from all my vineyards. So is a collage, is a, is a mosaic of what my property brings to the table. So it's not your super movie star single vineyard with that specific character, but it's what Barbera is in his entire, I call it a textbook wine. Or a comfort movie. Exactly. It's what Barbera is in a very friendly way. So this one is concrete and then spends one year in the bottle, but no barrel aging, no oak at all. It's the pure expression of a Barbera. Look at the color. Beautiful nose. Like, I always say, this one is a sommelier dream, in the sense that when they give you the uh, um, blind tasting of the sommelier uh, um, examination, yes. you dream they give you this. Because it's such varietally correct that you put your nose, barbara. Doesn't fool you, doesn't trick you. It is what it is. It tells you merely what it is. It's the pure interaction of the vine with the soil. It has weight, it has a soft mouthfeel. You get some nice bright red fruit and a little bit of berry. Mm -hmm. And then I get a little bit of smoke, smokiness. And they all ask me, what's the barrel? Because of this smokiness, of this complexity, I'm like, no barrel. Oh, come on, it's not possible. That's what you do. If you select in your vineyard, if you treat your vineyard properly, mm -hmm. the identity comes through. So those are direct flavors driven from the soil through the vine into the glass. Um, tell people, and you see how soft it is? Yeah. Usually, Barbera Dusty are very acidic concrete. Yeah. That's the key. A lot of them have the. A, 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 sh a sharp knife like acidity. Exactly. This has a crisp acidity. The acidity is there, but it has, has this softness. You know, and we were talking about, you know, the terroir. I tell people, I go, you know, what was funny is one time I was in Venezia mm -hmm. and we were at a winery and we were drinking one of the whites and it smelled oaky because of all the smoke in it, mm -hmm. but it was from all the flint in the ground that Absolutely. when we went in there, they had to blast through 30 feet of uh, flint, flint to get to, to make their um, cellar. Mm -hmm. And you could actually smell that flint in the wine. Absolutely. And that's why I said it before, you want to stress the vine to a proper level because stressing the vine, uh, putting them very close, putting them in competition, or growing in between the rows, wheat. Mm -hmm. So the, the root of the wheat, they go in competition with the root of the vine and they absorb all the water in the first two, two feet. They force the vine to dig down, and that's what you want. You want the vine to dig deeply down to find the water, to find the humidity to survive. Because the more layers of stra you go through, the more layers of flavors you get into your wine. So each grower around the world try different tricks to force the vine to dig as deep as possible so they go through a lot of layers and they bring a lot of flavor. Are you allowed to irrigate in Piedmont? You're not allowed to irrigate in Piedmont, uh, especially for UCG wines. You're not allowed to irrigate. You can irrigate the first five years of a new life of a new vineyard okay to give enough energy to the vine to survive but then at the fifth year she needs to be independent it's like for a kid yeah. a kid needs to be pampered and and and, and i can say uh, look fed, after fed, fed look yeah. after to build the body when the body is built then you say okay that's the door go conquer the world but if you leave a kid from day one, outside is going to die in two hours. You know, you, you cannot do that. So uh, there is no difference between a vine and a human being. We, we, we think and we react to life in the same way. I've, I've said that sometimes. I said, you know, I mean, in the area, like, in the areas where they, in, in California, and I'm not knocking this, I'm just saying, you know, you know they irrigate, they fertilize, and you have all the vines up at, at the top near the, near the surface, 
you pay a premium to have an appellation on the name, but it doesn't have that taste. Where if they're stressing those vines, then you get that Rutherford dust or that Oakville uh, volcanic soil in, in, in the wine, for example. And um, that's, that's one of the things that I found interesting. I say that, you know, think of a vine that if we were like people and we could just sit in our easy chair and everything is brought to us and we didn't have to exercise and we didn't have to work, we would be fat, unhealthy, and lazy. Absolutely. And that's what irrigation and fertilization does as opposed to making the, the vines or work to find, the, to find the nutrients and survive. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I don't um, disagree on help if they, uh, this global warming, which everybody denies, but it's happening, they, they present new challenges. Like if, um, if all of a sudden Italy become a, a, a desert, mm -hmm. of course, if you want to produce something, we will need to give some water to those grapes. But so far, so good. So we let the vine to be independent and interpret every vintage. Every vintage is different. And so if you, instead, you manage it um, commercially, if you manage it uh, from an industrial perspective, just what you just said, X milligrams of fertilizer per vine, X milliliters of water per vine, it become a recipe. But you take the soil away. You take the soil away from the wine. The take wine the character. The character. You, the soul, the character. You, yes. You're drinking an alcoholic beverage exactly. that has certain flavors, but you don't get that sense, that true sense of place. Exactly. Exactly. Now, don't forget, vintage matters. Of course, we just talked about it. Every vintage is slightly, slightly, Slight, slightly different. Slightly, slightly different from the other, but the quality is always there. That's my point. Okay, like a good producer make always good wine, regardless what the vintage is. So you think vintage doesn't matter? It matters. You always make good wine, the small producer, because I always say you own the season. So you cut physically, you cut down what is not good. God was not very good with you that year. A lot of rain, the hail, uh, too much rain, the frost. So you go in the vineyard and you cut physically down your production. Don't forget, production means money. So you cut your money down on the floor and you leave only a few clusters, the ones that actually are still beautiful. So even in a bad vintage, I always come up with a good one. But I might, maybe I produce 30% less or 40% less or 50% less or 70% less. So sounds crazy, but a bad vintage cost me more than a good vintage to make. Do you, I also tell people that an off vintage is the best year to buy Valpolicella because you get a lot of declassified fruit exactly. in your regular Valpolicella that a great vintage Valpolicella is all about it. You might, it's all in the Amarone, so you might want to skip the Valpolicella from the great years, but buy everyday Valpolicella in the off years. And, and it, it, this rule applies to every single appellation. In, in a bad vintage, instead of looking for single vineyard Barolo, you buy a regular Barolo or Nebbiolo d'Alba. Because what usually is the upper part of the hill with the best exposure and is so good to make reserve wine, reserva, the vintage was bad, so that amazing grape get classified into regular Barolo. If it's really that bad, goes into Nebbiolo. So you have Nebbiolo that are amazing. 2014, just to throw an example. You can drink amazing Nebbiolo 2014. You can drink amazing Rosso di Montalcino. Don't drink the Brunello, drink the Rosso. You get amazing Rosso. My Valpolicella 2014, I didn't even make Amarone. I skipped the vintage. I made only Valpolicella, but that Valpolicella, if you're asking me, how is 2014 Valpolicella? It's the best vintage I've ever had. Of course, everything we put on the side to make Amarone goes into that. Goes into and, that. And it's an affordable everyday price point. That's Absolutely. the other thing. Your regular, so you know. So and I, I take the loss. You take the loss, and you get the gain. I always say, wine is a Absolutely. food item. You shouldn't go broke buying your meal. So if you're looking for a bargain, this is a tip. 
you know, hey, here's a great tip. Bacuricella di pasto. That's the way to go. Right. You know, buy the off vintages for the everyday stuff and the great vintages for the reserve. I, I, I agree. Now, I agree. Here, here, okay, so here's a geeky question I was going to save for later, but we've brought up vintages multiple times now. Are you a science fiction fan? Yes. Okay, you like Doctor Who? Doctor Who, yeah. Okay, all right. So this is going to be more fun. Okay, so who's your favorite doctor? Just out of curiosity. In, in the movies? In the TV show, yeah, in, in Doctor Who. Which, which, do you have a favorite doctor or? No, not specifically. Okay. I like, uh, I like the show in general. You like the show? Okay, so one of the doctors shows up, all right? And we have a, we have a TARDIS now. And we get to do, you get to do a vertical of wine. Of any wine you want, as many vintages that you want. Mm -hmm. But because you have a time machine, you no longer have an age variance and vintage variance. It's all the same age. So you could do whatever wine you wanted. You know, say, I want to sample X wine at mm -hmm. 15 years of age. And then you have however many vintages you want. And they're all 15 years of age. It doesn't matter whatever you decide. Oh, okay. Okay. So here's the question. Here's the first question. What wine would you do if you could do a vertical like that? I have no doubt. Barolo. Barolo? Yes. What producer? Now you're pushing it. <laughs> See, I said one wine. Now you're pushing <laughs> it. Uh, I must say Alessandro Rivetta. Okay. Of course, he's, he's one of my producers. So I, I know him extremely well, and the Rivetto family has been there for multiple generations, and, uh, and they are but all producers, so they that's what they do. They do they be all great. So, you do so. I would take a vertical of his parole, all yeah. the same. Well, how many years of age would you want to see all of them on? I would, I would like to see them at 25 years old. 25, so yeah. every, you know, you could do 1920 with 25 years versus uh 2020, with right? 20. And I would try the different single vignettes, okay? And that would be the fun part, like yeah. same, same vintage. Same grapes, same producer, but Regola Barolo versus Saralunga versus Lazzarito and versus Vignarionda. So you have the three most famous single vineyard crew of Barolo and see how they oh, perform so at 25 years. Yeah, side by, yeah. Because side by know, side. It's, it's fun to do vertical, but how can you truly judge something 10 versus 30 years? Exactly. Now, exactly. now here's the next, next two parts of the question. Where would you want to drink it? And who would you want to drink that with? Oh, those are very interesting questions. See, that's a geeky question. First of all, <laughs> never alone. I will never drink the wine by myself. Okay. I will never do that experiment by myself because wine is a shared emotion. Yes. 100%. And so the that's more, why I said, who would you? Exactly. Drink? The more the wine gets complex, I would say the less you drink, the more you smell. And it's all about smelling and having a conversation. So I would drink it with Alessandro. Okay. He needs to be there for sure, because we need to have the hands of the guy. Uh, I would have you. Oh, thank you. There. And uh, I would uh, actually throw some good bodies on mine that are uh, very different. Some geek mm -hmm. and also some doesn't sound right, but like normal consumer, like person that just enjoy the wine for the pleasure of the wine without overanalyzing. A random person off exactly. the street. Exactly. We just show up in the middle of wherever exactly. in this TARDIS and we go, do you want to go to exactly. a wine tasting? Because that's my in. customer, first of all. Yeah. But also it's fun to see that when you get something that amazing, mm -hmm. you know, with a time machine, everybody becomes fascinated. Even the guy that, that says, oh, I know nothing about wine. It doesn't matter if you know nothing about wine. We said it before. I didn't know anything about the cow. I don't raise cow. I don't know the name of the cow. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the name of the pig, but I love barbecue. I yeah. know what I like. So to have your Paolo Rossi, your John Smith yeah. at the table there, and, and maybe we start talking. At the beginning, we'll be kind of on the side because he thinks, I don't want to say anything stupid. I don't want to be, I don't want to look dumb. But then 
the wine will fascinate the guy, will court him, like, a, like when you're courting a beautiful woman, and then he would be totally in love, and then he would start sharing his emotions. His, his, I always tell people, you know, some people say, I know I'm supposed to like this, or should I like this, or I go, if you don't like it, so what? So what if it's a hundred dollar bottle of wine, you don't like it, you like the five dollar, dump it. Good for you. Drink what you like. That's all that matters. You're the one buying it. You're the one drinking it. Don't force yourself to drink something Absolutely. because somebody tells you. Now, my favorite line after when I say you're not you're not uh, married to a wine, so you should try all of them. You have yes. to be faithful. My second favorite is like you're not married. You can dump at any time. <laughs> you don't like it? Say yeah. Dump. Yeah. You're not committed. Yeah. I like that. I'm I move on. I'm, yeah, uh, you know, un, un, unlike a relationship, that wine is easy to dump. Exactly. <laughs> you're in a relationship, you're stuck there. Like, oh damn it! Or am I just gonna cost me? Oh my god! No, you don't like it, you dump it. That's it. You move on. Right. You don't. No hard feelings. And, and trust me, there are no wine experts. They pretend to be. And wine doesn't like experts. Wine like lovers. You want a wine lover. You don't want a wine expert. The wine expert tends to overanalyze, and most of the time, just between us, because nobody is watching, right? No, no. Just between us, the wine experts are a huge pain in the neck. So you just want to enjoy the flavors. So I don't know nothing. You don't have to know anything. It's the wine that talks to you. It's not you that talk to the wine. It's the wine that reveals the layers, the flavor, the perfumes. That's what the, that's the gimmick of the wine. I tell people, you know. The worst thing for the wine industry are the people in the wine industry. Absolutely. Because they, I, at restaurants and stores, people go, oh, I can't believe you're buying that. You buy this. And I always, always tell people, never apologize for what you like. I go, I mean. You like what you like. You like what you like. I go, now, personally, personally, I mean, you know, I, I can't see drinking one specific thing with the entire meal, you know, like yes. like like a big, there, are, there are some rules, right? But but but, but if that's what you like, go for it. But yeah. experiment, you know, you know. I mean, when when somebody says I only like sweet, then I'm like, then fine, drink sweet. Some of the most expensive wine in the world are sweet. sweet. That's <laughs> what I tell people. I go sauternes and ports and ice wines, Absolutely. ounce per ounce, and I said, you know what? I like them. I love them. Yeah. Try I can it. spend with it this much of Saturn, three hours. Yeah. Three hours. Like, you know, try an ice wine. I don't think I was born with such a long thing. This got longer and longer because I... The I'm, wine is in your nose. The, the, I'll tell you, I try ice wine with a uh, blackberry hopper sometimes. But, um, or, or, or sweet wines with cheese. Yeah. Saturn and nice stinky cheese. Now here, here's the next, okay. the last part of the question, though. Or the last. Part oh yeah. Of that. Okay. Where would you have this? Where because, now? Remember, you have a space and time machine. So I mean, you could you you could have you you could go back to ancient Rome. You could go anywhere you wanted. I'd be uh, very very simple on this. I will be at home. At home? Yeah, in my little kingdom. Yeah. See, I, yeah. I have a magical place. I'm lucky and uh, and very relaxing there. With my property here in the vineyard with my buddies, a nice loaf of bread, a lot of a lot of fun cheese, and those marvelous wine, big glasses, and relax and bullshit is the most beautiful part. <laughs> Bullshitting. <laughs> we will talk a little bit about the wine, and then the conversation will steer into something else, and then we're gonna go back to the wine because the wine doesn't have to be the conversation. No. The wine brings the conversation up and then we talk about everything. And going back and forth. And, and then you see that the, the sun goes down and the moon rising out of the Valpolicella. It's beautiful like this. This big and then and then all of a sudden, oh it's two o'clock in the morning. Oh no, the sun is risen. Exactly. It just takes me back to my days on Bourbon Street. So that was an easy answer. Like where it would be in the comfort of my property. Because I have the best memories there. Because don't forget that the reason why kids don't like wine and adults like wines, and you start appreciating wine in your adult, uh, more adult ages, is because wine is all about flavors. But the flavors that you get in the wine 
when you smell and you say this smell like uh, uh, pear, green apple, cassis, tart, tobacco, cigar box, mint, uh, you know, all those different flavors, those are flavors that you recognize into the wine. If you don't have that library of perfumes in your brain, you're, you're not capable to recognize anything. And so you need to experience life to be exposed to those flavors, and then you recognize the flavors into your wine. We so relive our life when we drink wine. I mean, I've, I've told people, I said, Open the memories. My, my favorite style of Zinfandel or Primitivo, the ones that have the big blackberry flavors, mm -hmm. because it reminds me of being a kid picking blackberries in southern Missouri. Okay, next wine. We jump back in the car. Okay. And we have a, a little bit of a drive. We go from Piemonte to Toscany, which are the two most popular wine region of Italy so far, but we have many to talk about. And basically from Piemonte, which is the northwest corner of the Alps, we go down to Liguria, uh, Genoa. We pass by the Cinque Terre, which is a beautiful place. And then we keep going to Toscany. Once we get to Livorno, which is on the coast, we go east and we go inland and we go in the Chianti area. So Chianti is an area among the region of Toscany. If you grow Sangiovese grape in the Chianti area, you can make a wine that takes the name of the area of Chianti. Usually Chianti was a blend of different varietals, Sangiovese, Ciliegiolo, Canaiolo, Malvasia, Trebbiano. But since 1998, Chianti can actually be also 100% Sangiovese. So there are two uh, major areas for Chianti. The regular Chianti, which is this quite broad area within the region, or the Chianti Classico, which is the best area for the production of Chianti. So every time on an Italian label you read the word Classico, means that that specific appellation come from the best area where the wine was born back in history. So you can have Chianti and Chianti Classico. Valpolicella, Valpolicella Classico. Soave, Soave Classico. Verdicchio, Verdicchio Classico. Like every wine can be regular or classical. In this case, this one is a, a regular Chianti. Okay. So it's your everyday Chianti. So something not pretentious, something that is is grown, the grape can come from the broader area, so we told you, the more you get little, the more you get unique. The more you get broad, the more you get easy and friendly. So this one is your friendly, everyday, 100% Sangiovese, not pretentious, you don't have to open the bottle two hours before, you don't have to decant it. This one is another barbecue wine. You can have a sandwich, you can have a, 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 a chicken salad, you can have a, a um, your leftovers from the day before, you can have a, a bowl of pasta. You can have, or you can order pizza and get pizza. So if this one is your everyday, not pretentious Chianti. You get some nice cherry flavors, a little bit of leathery notes to it, a little hint of citrus. Citrus, and then you just nailed it. Leather, cherries, and citrus. That's it, what you have. And it's beautiful to see them side by side because this one is 100% Barbera, mm -hmm. this one is 100% Sangiovese. So you see the two different soul, and they're not even by vaguely similar. They're so no. different. And we're looking at two entry level wine. Usually, entry level wine, they taste all the same. But that's the beauty of Italy. Two entry level wine, and they are remarkably different in style and in flavor. So you can spend $14 retail, $14.15, bucks, $14.99, so getting into the entry-level wine, but two completely different flavors. You don't have your like pedestrian Merlot, your pedestrian cup. It's just two varietal, and they're like day and night one from the other. This, you know, this one has the weight, the acidity, and the profile that this would actually be a wonderful Thanksgiving wine. Oh, yeah. I mean... You get, and actually coming from a little kid, you got some character here. You get, this one drags you back to Tuscany. That's the what I like. Yes, we are not talking about the philosophy of winemaking. This one would be a wine that we casually 
sipping without even thinking about it, but it takes you to Tuscany with the hay, you know, the grass, when the, yeah. when the grass gets dry, you smell the hay, you know, when, you, when you're driving the car, they're mowing the lawn and you, and you breathe it, that's, the, that, that's it, two, three perfumes, simple, simply like good enough to engage you, yeah. but, but easy enough that you, boom, it's gone, yeah, now, now I move <laughs> on, oh wow, those are big, oh, oh now we're overanalyzing. Here we don't overanalyze. No. We said it is healthy because don't forget, I always say there are two different words. And Italian are lazy. So if they invented two <laughs> words, there are two different meanings. So one is quality and one is complexity. And those two words are completely different and they will stand two different meanings. Quality is how a wine is made, is what you use to make it, is the raw material. Complexity is what the wine showcase. So if you refer to a building, quality is actually the, the bricks, the concrete, the steel that you're actually using. Is it good grade or is poor grade? Complexity is the design that the architect put on that specific building. The end result? Exactly. Okay. So you can have a building that it doesn't look very pretty, but it's super solid material so it's high quality, the storm comes in, it doesn't move. It's not fancy to look, but it's very good quality. Or you can have a beautiful building made with beautiful material, but also great design, which is a piece of art. Wow, you, then you admire it also. But let's not forget, you can have a very simple wine that doesn't deliver a lot of complexity, but be extremely high quality, which means very healthy grape, and very honorable wine making. So the wine doesn't kill your stomach, doesn't kill your kidney, yeah. and you don't have to have a liver transplant, transplant at the end of the day. And this is extremely important, and I will never talk enough about this, because especially with entry-level wine, low-cost wine, the only way you can cut your cost is mass-producing. Mass-producing means using a lot of chemicals, and that's when the quality goes down. So it's important to find entry-level wine from boutique producer so you know that the raw material that they used was organically grown, was very healthy. So you drink a wine that is simple, but with a quality that doesn't give you a headache the next day you wake up. It's, it's the people that actually own the land that are putting the juice into the bottles with their name on it. I mean, they're not going to, I mean, Jeopardize your reputation. Jeopardize your reputation, but Absolutely. also it's almost like a drug that the more you spray, the more you use chemicals, the more you need. And it's kind Absolutely. of a it's a vicious, it's, it's, it's a, a vicious, vicious cycle. Cycle. Yeah. And you know, I mean you could and I've always found it fascinating that is it a matter of do the does it make a difference in the taste quality? Or is it that somebody is spending that much time, effort, and energy, and that's what translates into the quality or a combination thereof? Either it's way, both. you do taste a difference because, I mean, you can't do that maybe on 2,000 acres, but when you're talking, what, 100 acres here or 50? This one, under acres, here is like uh, uh, so 22 acres. Okay, so... You're talking small parcels, Absolutely. not mass. No, because if it gets too big, you don't have enough time to be so anal in selection because you have so much. So if you really want to be focused on single vineyard, you have to manage a small property because it's literally going every day and you see what grows around. Like, I'm not making this up. You can see the color of the vine changing in the same vineyard. And so you can really say, okay, those three rows they go in those yellow container and we ferment it here and we will age it over there those this middle section goes into this container it goes into that tank but if you have like a thousand acres you cannot beat that maniac into the selection you get all the entire vineyards goes into this massive you know five hundred thousand or a million gallon and that's it one of the things i've also noticed with the organic or sustainable vineyards is when I visit some of the vineyards, the guys that spray, you don't see quail running out in the vineyards. Mm -hmm. 
but the guys who don't, you see actually large quail populations in California. And, I, and the thing I tell people is that a baby quail is the size of a bumblebee when it's hatched. Mm -hmm. Its entire diet is actually insects. Absolutely. And when you're spraying, you're killing every insect in the vineyard so you don't see the quail, where the guys that aren't spraying have the quail, but they're also using predator insects to kill the bad insects. Or they've explained to me that they'll plant a low-growing cover crop that the insects will attack that, which is below the grape line. So they don't have, you know, so they're using things that the bugs will attack that before it attacks the grapes. Absolutely. Or they use other predator uh, things. It's absolutely true. And those, as when I said before, there are only two ways of making the wines and applies all over the world. They do those things in California, those small growers, we do the same. It's the same thing. The common sense, the, the ratio is to have the best environment for the vine. If you sterilize a vineyard, mm -hmm. you get something sterile. And the word sterile speaks by itself. It is sterile. Sterile? Sterile, yes. It's, it's sterile. There is nothing there. It's sterile. It's like white. It's, there is no flavor. There is nothing. It's sterile. But if your vineyard is alive, is a microclimate, is a macrocosmo with all the insects, even, even the parasites, you need some parasites too. They are part of the environment. The point is to keep them on a certain proper level. So you either spray and kill everything and you get a very sterile wine or you can, as you said, attract predator for that specific insect. So you attract the predator to keep that population down. Or one of the things that we actually use is called sexual confusion, which there is a lot of sexual confusion around too, but what is the sexual confusion? Basically, very simple. They, we buy uh, strings that look like this long, mm -hmm. and they are full of pheromones, for example, for the white fly, which is a big problem also for olive trees. And you put those strings every uh, 30 feet, and those strings spread female pheromones. So what happened? That all the male smell the female and they all go in the vineyard. All the female, they say, too many girls around here, too much competition, let's go somewhere else because I gotta find a guy, right? So all the, all the female leave, all the male goes there so they don't mate. All the guys that get there thinking to party and then like, eh, there is a sausage factory. Exactly. <laughs> so basically, in this way, instead of killing them, you're lowering the number of the ones that are actually capable to mate. So the female will put the egg, but the egg will not hatch, so it will not sting the, the grape. Oh, so no, that's no. a very natural way of lowering the population of the bad insects. Wow. And that's a, it's, a, it's something that really works. Now, let's not forget, organic farming, it's absolutely important, like all our wineries, mine too, are organic. We're not certified because I don't believe into certification, but if you're a small producer, I'm the fourth generation, as I told you. Yeah. If my great-grandfather was using herbicide, pesticides, fertilizing, I would never get anything. The soil would be dead. Three generations later, I have nothing. So, me, we need to let me say the previous generation works for the next one. So, me, I'm working to give something to my kid. So, if I rape my soil, what do I give? I give an empty shell. So, it's our own interest to make it as more healthy as possible so I have something to pass along. And that's the name of the game. You, you don't own the land. You are tending the land for the next generation Absolutely. and the generation thereafter. You want to leave it in a better condition for your descendants than the way you found it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And farming is all about common sense. It's common sense. There are, as I said, very few rules, but very precise. And it's common sense. If you try to use your vineyard or your field as a factory, then you change the mentality from farming, which is interpreting the every season, into 
what do I need? What are the chemicals that I need into the wine? What are the chemicals that I need into the soil? And you supply, you supply, you supply. But as you said, you, it's like a drug addict. You need more, you need more, you need more. To the point that yeah, become desert. Well, that was actually very educational. And thank you for joining us. It was such a pleasure, my friend. And I look forward to doing the next three ones Absolutely. very soon. And I'll this is Nicola Piscardo. I'm Ray Maxwell. Thank you for joining us at Vine Chat on Chow St. Louis. Don't forget to uh, take care of our sponsors. And here's to living a wild wildlife. Cheers. Salute. Eviva.